Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Jordan Bateman. He's the Vice President of Communications and Marketing for the Independent Contractors and Business Association in B.C. His website, icba.ca. Welcome back to the show, Jordan. Thanks for having me, Jim. Jordan, uh, you noticed something that the B.C. NDP government has uh, really ramped up their staffing numbers, and yet, uh, for essential services, we're short of nurses, we're short of paramedics, we're short of emergency dispatchers, we're short other medical personnel and facilities. Uh, how come they haven't used this staffing increase to improve the areas where people are dying? Well... That's a good question. You'll have to ask the provincial government. But, you know, the numbers were staggering. And um, I, I got to tip my hat to Rob Shaw at the orca.ca for reporting this because I haven't seen it anywhere else. Uh, he says that since 2017, when the NDP took power, the public sector, i.e., the people who work for provincial government, have grown from 310,000 people to 490,000. That's a growth of 58% since 2017. And, yeah, I, I'm sure some of them have you know, working for health authorities or schools, etc. But a whole swack of them are also working for uh, the core government itself, in political offices, um, in new uh, bureaucracy that's been set up, like, uh, you know, the Human Rights Tribunal and the Civil Resolution Tribunal. And then, of course, there's the group that, um, you know, works on uh, the union-only monopoly, on uh, big public infrastructure projects. So, you know, you're seeing government well at a time where the private sector is just starting to pull itself up off the mat of the pandemic and you know, these poor business owners are pulling themselves up and realizing that holy smokes our tax burden is getting heavier and heavier and the red tape's getting heavier and heavier um, you know because we're having to pay for government so it's uh this is gonna have a drag on the economy and it's something that you know the ndp uh need to be held to account for Yes. Well, uh, with this uh, drag on the economy, what can the government do to improve things for small and medium-sized businesses that you represent? Well, you know, they need to start looking at every decision they make through the filter of, you know, does this encourage small businesses, does it encourage entrepreneurism? And if it doesn't, they better have a darn good justification as to why they're bringing that policy into place. Um, you know, we are at a time where... Uh, Many businesses have been limping along, trying to survive the pandemic. Uh, many haven't made it. Um, some have. Uh, lots have, but many have not. But almost every business, uh, not almost every, but a huge chunk of businesses are in trouble and just trying to survive. Whatever can be done to encourage small businesses in, uh, in British Columbia needs, needs to happen. And you and I have talked about some of the ideas in the past. Um, that makes sense. The other thing they need to do is, you know, there is kind of <laughs> three chronic shortages in British Columbia. There's a labor shortage. There is a, um, uh, a shortage of common sense among government. And there's a supply shortage. And so, you know, government's got to start thinking of ways to work through these different issues. With labor shortages, it's, you know, putting more effort resources into training, um, opening training spots, finding more innovative ways to train than, you know, sending plumbing apprentices from around, you know, the province to have to go to the lower mainland to, to go to a school, but instead finding ways to train them at home, um, you know, for uh, the supply shortage, finding ways to, you know, invest in the ports and the transportation system, encourage more truck drivers, all those different things to, to move, uh, you know, to do the logistics of, uh, of you know, supplying the entire region with all the different uh, things that we need. And then on the common sense side, just you know, being smarter, like cut red tape, find ways to give um, small business tax breaks. Like let's let's invest in our entrepreneurs and give them a chance to uh, grow the economy. 
Well, I know some places like uh, England to encourage small business, they don't charge them any taxes for the first five years of business or something like that. I'm not sure of the exact regulations, but they don't want to get in the way of small business because they employ over 70% of the population. Yeah, to me, it's such a natural thing. Like, the more people you have out there creating jobs, the better off your economy is going to be, right? Like, <laughs> this is the problem. Right now, the private sector is being asked to uh, basically work with one arm tied behind their back. Um, and while they're at it, you know, lug a, lug a growing uh, government cost, uh, drag it along with them. And this is a, an ideological issue with the NDP, right? You know, None of, or uh, very few of their folks, their MLAs come from small business backgrounds. Very few of them have ever taken the risk of, of starting their own small business. Most of them are, you know, former activists or union employees or, you know, people who worked in the public sector, uh, all of which, you know, have important roles to play within government and a caucus. But if you don't have anyone who's actually started a business, you know, went without to make sure that there was enough money in the account to pay the employees, um, you know, struggle to build something, that is uh, a big hole within their uh, within their worldview. And they don't really have anyone like that, and you're starting to see it in these policies that are starting to add up. So, you know, it's one thing to want to invest in public services. I think, you know, everyone does. But, you know, to do it, um, <laughs> to grow a public sector by 58% uh, in just four years, that is a staggering amount, and people should pause and think to themselves, you know, are we getting 58% better service from our public sector uh, than we were in 2017? No, no, of course not. Uh, we're certainly not getting 58% uh, uh, more service, uh, let alone better service. You have to ask whether this has been worth it. We'll have more with Jordan Bateman right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Jordan Bateman. Jordan, BC construction, for the most part, continued as normal during the pandemic. Uh, any other things that have cropped up because of it, or are things going smoothly? Well, there's a couple things that we can talk about, um, Jim, and, and one uh, is mental health, and one is the uh, supply shortage again. Well, I'll start with supply shortage because we've discussed it before. Um, we are seeing across the economy delays in uh, getting the necessary products in order to finish buildings, in order to build things. And it's not just in, in, in construction. Um, you know, I uh, follow a, 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 someone I graduated high school with. They have a very popular restaurant in South Surrey. They couldn't do their fried chicken sandwich today uh, because their deep fryer has been down for two weeks because there's a part that they cannot get and they're trying everything to source it and the supply chain is just frozen up. There, there's no way to get this part. And so, you know, these folks uh, can't sell their world-famous chicken, uh, fried chicken sandwiches. The Carvery, by the way, in South Surrey. It's a great restaurant. Um, you know, in construction, we were seeing it with rebar, with steel, with uh, siding, with paint, with all sorts of products. Uh, the mecha things you need to run uh, the mechanics of a building, uh, the building, you know, plumbing uh, supplies. Everyone is kind of in a bit of a holding pattern. They're still doing the work. They're still struggling through, but you know, projects are falling behind simply because there isn't the supplies in order to finish them off. And you know, this isn't unique to BC or Vancouver or even Canada. You know, I know that uh, President Biden was having high-level meetings on the supply shortages there. Um, there's ships circling in the Pacific that don't have space to dock at port. And if they had space at the port, they don't have the you know, longshoremen to actually unload them, and then they don't have enough trains and trucks to, to transport the materials out. We are in a very desperate labor shortage, and there doesn't seem to be any understanding that like we need to be finding ways to get more people into the workforce um, as quickly as possible. Uh, even if it's not full-time workers, um, just any, anyone who can work, let's get them, let's find a place for them. Uh, that is problematic, and I think it's a little bit of a sign that, you know, society uh, as a whole maybe doesn't consider hard work as important anymore or, you know, has gotten used to some of the supports that were in place during the COVID pandemic. You know, 
we've got to reset our notion here and, and make sure that we're, we're finding ways to encourage people to enter the workforce because um, there are good-paying jobs that are going unfilled right now. And frankly, good-paying jobs that are going unfilled, they're very important to the functioning of our, uh, of our society and our economy. Do we have to change the perception that being in the trades is somehow a second-class job? You have to go to university and push paper or uh, run a keyboard to be a successful person. Oh, absolutely. You know, one of the things that bothered me about uh, the former Green Party leader in British Columbia was back uh, when Site C, the NDP were trying to decide whether they were going to keep Site C going or not, he kind of made some comments to the local media that were looking down his nose at tradespeople, like, you know, these are just jobs moving dirt, and kind of wrinkled his nose and in that very high-minded uh, academic uh, way that um, Dr. Andrew Weaver had. <sighs> we should be encouraging people to go into the trades. Man, if you have any kind of entrepreneurial spirit at all, the trades are an incredible opportunity for you. Go get a, you know, work for a few years, get a red seal, uh, you'll learn your trade, strike it on your own, form your own company, and grow your business. Like You can do very, very well uh, in the trades. And instead, we kind of think, well, you know, that person should be designing websites or coding or, you know, all these kind of white-collar jobs when, you know, the blue-collar economy is still the, you know, incredibly um, desirable. It's, uh, these are family-supporting jobs that people can do very well at. And, uh, and there's job security. Like, guess what? The world's always going to need plumbers and the world's always going to need electricians and the world's always going to need framers and the world's always going to need drywall hangers. And like, these are things that, um, you can be certain that there will be jobs in the future for. So, uh, yeah, we should be encouraging as many people as possible to explore the trades. We should be treating trades programs and red seals with the same kind of fanfare that we treat university graduations. Um, it, it shouldn't be, um, you know, this kind of wrinkling your nose and, wow, that person went to a trade school. It's not nearly as impressive as you know, graduating from SFU. Instead, we should be encouraging folks to uh, to look at the trades as a, a very viable career option. Well, if you go to BCIT, the, B, the British Columbia Institute of Technology, when you graduate, you're job ready. Uh, all the experience I had going to BCIT, math for business or taking software system development, the day you walk out the door, you're ready to do those jobs. Mm -hmm. Well, you're exactly right. And I do think there's a second element that can be added to a lot of that curriculum, which is small business management, essentially. You know, my daughter is um, uh, in first year university. She's considering being a midwife. It's uh, been a passion for her for many years. Um, as a teenager, she uh, kind of found this, and, and uh, she's sort of headed down that path. And I've been encouraging her, like, take some business classes, too, because, you know, at some point you may want to have your own uh, practice. You may want to employ people, and having that little bit of business background will, will serve you in good stead. The same is true with, uh, with the trades, you know, teaching folks how to run a little small business, how to, you know, market themselves, how to set that stuff up would be very, uh, very helpful. Um, making people not just job ready, but making them uh, economy ready uh, that would be a good thing. And, and then you can flip it, you know, for folks going into business, you know, having them do, you know, the opposite and spending a little bit of time learning, you know, a little bit about trades or another, uh, kind of hands on, uh, work experience. That could be helpful as well for them as they, uh, as they plan their business career. So, you know, we need to kind of have more holistic views of, of this, of, uh, of training, of education in general, and find ways to make sure that, uh, young people are exposed to as many different options as possible. How is BC doing with housing starts? Uh, we always seem to have a, a shortage of single-family homes or uh, even duplexes. Well, governments, municipal governments, especially regional ones, don't like single-family homes. Um, they're trying to steer clear of them. Uh, you know, even in a place like Langley, which most folks would think of as a bedroom community for Vancouver, you know, suburban uh, suburban area. Um, the you know, number of single-family homes are far being started is far less than the condos and, and townhouses that are being built. Um, so that's all changed. So yeah, it's harder and harder to get a, a single-family home, which is kind of why you're seeing the price get driven up so high on those. Uh, they're just not making very many more single-family lots. And you know, so for families and, and people who have one now, um, you know, they're sitting on something that will definitely help their retirement. Um, but you know, for folks who maybe want that space. You know, the options are becoming more limited and more expensive. 
Um, housing starts are are solid. Um, I'm not sure they're spectacular, but you know there is plenty of work going on. Um, we're starting to see a little bit of the approval pipelines um, slowing down again. Municipalities, uh, we speak about labor shortages. Municipalities are seeing staff poached um, fairly regularly because there's a big competition for talent right now. Uh, that is slowing down approvals. Government has not done a good job of maybe, you know, <laughs> responding to that by perhaps reducing some of the red tape, you know, making it a little bit easier to get approvals instead of, uh, you know, making it, uh, you know, taking sometimes years in order to process permits. Uh, but uh, it is slowing down in that. So that could be a bit of a, a concern on the horizon. But housing demand is so high. There's so many um, millennials and, and now uh, the generation following them uh, growing up and now starting to enter wanting to enter the uh, the housing market, um, you know, at some point we are going to see an opening up of immigration again to uh, higher levels, I'm sure, especially if we have a labor shortage. So there's all these pressures on the, the housing market that will keep it, I, I think, keep people building for quite a while. Well, uh, we've promised uh, Syrian refugees refuge, uh, now people from Afghanistan who actually qualify to come to Canada and, and are tied up in the pipeline somewhere. We're going to need homes for these people. I think it's kind of funny, though. We have a a government saying we're against letting foreigners buy homes, but if you admit all these people, technically they're foreigners. <laughs> Aren't they supposed to have homes? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, we've talked before, right? You know, Elias Pedersen and Quinn Hughes, prominent Vancouver Canucks, they start playing tonight. Uh, you know, those are technically foreigners, but you know, of course we want them to buy homes, right? We want them to commit to our, our communities long term. So nothing is as simple as government would like to paint it, um, particularly this government. Uh, I don't like this creating others and enemies of, of people who simply want to move here and create a better life in Canada. Like we got to be very careful about how we treat um, newcomers to Canada because you know these are people who have chosen us and, and want to come here and you know, want to put down roots and, and want to um, invest in businesses and and, uh, and bring their talents here. So it's, it's so easy to get caught in the game of blaming, trying to blame someone else for something, for everything that happens uh, in life. Um, you know, we need to be looking at the other side of the equation as well, which is, you know, if we lower taxes on housing, if we found a way to approve it more quickly, if we found areas where we could develop um, these homes, uh, would that bring down prices uh, or help moderate price increases? I think it would. Was there a sigh of relief in the business community when uh, Mayor Kennedy Stewart of Vancouver cast the deciding vote against charging homeowners a parking tax to park in front of their own home? And depending on when you bought the vehicle and the size of it, you could have been paying up to a thousand dollars a year. I think there were some raised eyebrows that he actually voted against it. Um, I thought, I think a lot of people thought this was a done deal. Um, in his remarks, I'm not a big fan of Candy Stewart, but in his remarks explaining why he voted against it, he specifically pointed out that it's especially hurtful to blue collar families, uh, blue collar workers who don't have other options. Um, he's bang on with that. It's also unfair to uh, lower income uh, folks who don't have the money to pay for off-site parking somewhere. Uh, that is quite correct. So he made the right decision. I do worry that this is going to get packaged up in a different way. And knowing Vancouver, the problem with Vancouver is they're always trying to invent new ways to get their hands into their taxpayers' pockets. And I think a, a lot of taxpayers are just sick and tired of that, and rightfully so. Um, I just marveled at the outrage and hand-wringing on Twitter from the... Um, the people who supported this tax, basically trying to equate it with, you know, <laughs> like this is why climate change is happening because, you know, we're not charging for on-street parking when really the climate change impact of this would have been very similar to taking a thimble and, you know, a thimble full of water out of an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Uh, it was really going to do absolutely nothing to combat climate change. It was a tax grab, pure and simple. Well, I know Vancouver uh, years ago wanted to decrease vehicle traffic into the downtown, so they took away thousands of parking spaces and increased parking fees. And then the next year, they decried that their parking revenue was down $800,000 because not enough people were going downtown. Well, you accomplished your goal. There's going to be side effects. Uh, politicians never seem to 
do studies or uh, take a look at the future. It's always now. Well, you recall, I called, talked about the shortage of common sense among our uh, our governing class, and <laughs> that is a perfect example of it. If you make it harder to go downtown and you make it more expensive to park, um, people won't go downtown as much. And, you know, you see it you see it with the state of businesses in places like uh, downtown Victoria and downtown Vancouver. There's a lot of empty... Uh, uh, empty windows, there's a lot of broken glass, broken uh, windows, uh, petty crime happening because there aren't as many eyes on the street. Uh, these are communities, uh, neighborhoods are struggling right now, business communities are struggling, and instead of finding ways to you know, make them safer, uh, encourage people to go to downtown Vancouver to shop, all those things, they just keep making it tougher and tougher and tougher. Well, you know, simple things like foot and bicycle patrols are totally effective in reducing that kind of petty crime, but have they increased those things, or do they just put more people in cars? Because when you're driving by on the street, something horrible can be happening, and you don't notice it. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I don't think the Vancouver police are being particularly... Uh, I don't think their relationship with council is particularly good at this point, so I'm not sure council is very interested in giving them much of uh, anything uh, as far as help and supports and resources go, so... Uh, but that will be an issue for, I guess, the next uh, municipal campaign next year uh, in Vancouver. Jordan, do you still see a, an overall labor shortage in construction, and are there uh, possible solutions to it? Yeah, the key is to increase training, for sure. But, you know, if you're out there listening, uh, or you know someone um, who wants a job, needs a job, go to icba.ca slash jobs. Uh, you can upload a resume there. We'll connect you with uh, one of our uh, thousands of construction employers. And there are literally hundreds of companies looking for workers. Um, you know, you do that, you could be on a work site by Monday uh, working and earning a very good living, um, building British Columbia, building some of the best infrastructure, homes, roads, schools, uh, some of uh, exciting projects going on. So icba.ca slash jobs. Well, I used to be a cat skinner, which the regular person would call a bulldozer operator when I was 17. Uh, and it was one of the best jobs I've ever had in my life, and it paid great. So I can imagine uh, the conditions are, are better now, and the pay is much better than back in 1974. Yeah, absolutely. There's no, there's absolutely no reason um, not to have a, a job. If you want a job, there's definitely one for you in construction. And we can certainly help uh, make that connection. And I can say for certain I grew up in construction camps and worked in construction myself. I certainly have no reason to look down my nose at anybody who gets their hands dirty building the infrastructure that we need to have a modern society. No, these are some of the most skilled uh, craftsmen in uh, craftspeople, or me, in all of uh, in society. These are uh, people who are problem solvers. Um, they're very proud of their work, and rightfully so. You, you know, I've talked to lots of kids of construction workers who sometimes go into construction as well themselves, and they'll tell lots of stories like, oh, you know, Dad, we drive around town, and oh, I built that, and I built that, and I built that house, and I built that bridge. And Like, there's a real pride um, that comes along with this work because it's tangible. You know, you start, you finish it, and then it's there, and it's making a positive contribution to society. So, uh, you know, we t definitely tip our hat to the uh, about 250,000 men and women who woke up this morning, strapped on the tool belt, picked up their hard hat, and went to work on a construction work site. They are doing marvelous things. Jordan, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. My guest has been Jordan Bateman, Vice President of Communications and Marketing for the Independent Contractors and Business Association in B.C. Check out his website, icba.ca. And if you're looking for a job, uh, take a look for the uh, IBA slash jobs page. If you have any questions for Jordan or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at Talk Digital Net. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.